Okay, welcome to tonight's webinar, starting off right with your new general manager. This is Mark Goring. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Thane Joyal and Carly Coulter, um, who will be introducing um, two of our guests and leading us in a very, very uh, thorough presentation of the uh, key principles of starting off right with your new general manager. Um, this is one of uh, many online recorded workshops uh, produced within the context of the SeaBuild program. We'll have a recording available in the SeaBuild library. Uh, as Joel Brock mentioned, we look forward to your input during the workshop, and we'll be finding ways to respond to your comments and questions during the presentation. If we don't get to them, we'll try and follow up with you directly after the, after the program. Um, and I would like to um, introduce Thane Joyal. Hello, Thane. Welcome. Hello, Mark. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to be here today and to have the chance to present this material with Mark and Carolee. And we're very lucky to have uh, two guests with us, I think. Uh, it's one thing to present this material in the abstract, but having people with real life experience. So we have actual new demo managers, relatively speaking, um, here today. And I'd like to ask them each just to say a couple words so that you can orient to their voices. We have Melanie Reed from Just Food. Good evening, everybody. I'm really happy to be here tonight and share a little bit of my experience with you. And we have Terry Bowling from La Montanita. Good evening, everyone. I'm additionally happy to be here and hope uh, you'll find this uh, workshop helpful. So we have some learning objectives for this workshop. And there are four of them, which are shown in the next slide. And I just want to set the framework for the uh, material we'll go over today. Key, and most importantly, um, in starting off with your new general manager, it's important to integrate the new general manager intentionally into your leadership team. Second, it's important that the board establish clear expectations for the new GM, conduct regular performance evaluations, and the key is to keep communication open, honest, it's important not to let the communication channels tilt in, keep them well used. We've created a structure, if you will, an outline for the presentation tonight. Um, first of all, Carol Lee is going to go over the key elements of integrating a new general manager, which are informal monthly support meetings, quarterly check-ins with the board, and then monitoring reports and schedule. And we'll be <clears throat> talking about how these elements can help the board um, get off on the right foot. Carolee? OK. Let's look at the next slide. When we discussed uh, this workshop and designing it, Thane and Mark and I found that it really boiled down to four key elements that it takes to integrate a new general manager. And these are the informal monthly support meetings of the board president. We will discuss each one of these in turn. The quarterly check-in with a full board. Uh, we, we, the expectations of monitoring on the part of the new GM, and especially paying attention to monitoring the policy on communications and support to the board. So we're going to take each of these in turn, and we're also going to hear from our guests about their own experience with this. So often when boards want to evaluate a general manager, they, um, they, they are at a loss to figure out how to do it and think they need to come up with some other form. And we have already done an online recorded workshop on evaluation of the general manager. But that was for general managers that are already there at the co-op and it immediately raised the issue for us, what do we do when the GM is new? So this is how, why we decided to develop this workshop, is we wanted to put in the hands of boards the tools to be able to see how their new general manager is doing and support that person. Let's look at the uh, informal monthly support meeting. This is a meeting between the board president and the GM. Uh, have the informality of the meeting is really important. It's a way of the board and the general manager 
board president and general manager being able to see each other's humanity and by sharing a meal or coffee and talking in a conversational way without a structured agenda, the, the relationship can develop well between both people who are leaders in the co-op. The emphasis is on building the relationship, not on trying to get specific business done. But one of the things that can happen at these meetings is to strategize how the board will address uh, agenda items that are upcoming. How will we talk about them? How will we structure those agenda items? Um, it is tempting, perhaps, for the board president to start playing consultant to the general manager and try to help the manager do problem solving on management issues. But it really it's best if the board president doesn't jump into operations but plays more of a sounding board and listens to the general manager and if anything might point them in the direction of resources without trying to solve management problems. And something that can help in getting this meeting to flow nicely is to spend five minutes at the start to compare lists of, but, of what both the board president and the general manager want to cover, and then five minutes at the end to talk about how the meeting went. Um, Hey, Melanie, you've had experience with uh, having informal monthly support meetings. Tell us what that was like for you when you started. I really appreciated these informal meetings. We've, we structured ours slightly differently in that we paired up two board members. So I would meet with two board members rather than just with the board president. It kind of rotated around the board. and. Um, for me, I found that it really helped to have somebody to listen to me when I just needed to talk about issues that I was having or challenges that I was facing, um, and that they they kind of acted as a little bit of a sounding board for me. Um, and it, it always seemed like the timing of these was perfect. It was just at the moment when I needed somebody to listen to me the most that we would end up getting together. And we would usually share a, a breakfast or a lunch. Um, it was really good to get to know them just kind of as people, as you mentioned, on a human level. And in fact, um, the meetings have been so productive that we are continuing to do them. Um, and sometimes I meet with the president, and sometimes I meet with other board members. But um, we all really appreciate them very much. And how about you, Terry? I found my situation was uh, a bit unique and that I uh, relocated 1,500 miles uh, to come work at La Montanita. And I came here uh, with my family still back in the state of Tennessee finishing out the school year. So I lived here for almost uh, six months by myself. New job, new home, new town. You know, it's quite stressful. And the board uh, would uh, say like on Saturday morning, they would, the president and vice president would say, come on and meet us up here at this certain restaurant. We just sit down and talk, and we really didn't talk so much about the co-op, but it's just about how are you adjusting? Is there anything we can do? Even little things, how I get from point A to point B, became a big thing in my life at that point. Right. And I found these meetings very supportive; that it kind of set the framework for our future relationship. And we 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 also have continued these meetings uh, uh, through today. I meet with the president and vice president monthly to uh, just go over any concerns. We have a small agenda. This is what we need to work on. This is what's coming up. Uh, do I have any concerns? Do they have any concerns? And I find that very productive in keeping the relationship open and uh, going very well. So what we're hearing here is that these monthly meetings are a great idea, and all co-ops would want to do them, whether your manager is new or not. But they're particularly crucial for building a good relationship when your GM is new. And also, I wanted to say that the fact that you follow different, slightly different formats and that you had, uh, in Melanie's case, some rotating board members, and in Terry's case, the vice president there, too, certainly that's not a problem. The point is having the informal meetings person to person like that. Okay. Hey, Carol Lee, this is Mark. If I could just jump in with one with one thing to build on that last comment. While the informality is great and the focus on the relationship is really the point, um, that one bullet point on the on the introduction slide of really making sure that you think about um, 
you spend a couple minutes in the beginning and the end just to check in, hey, what is it that we, you know, think we want to cover today? And at the end, you take a few minutes to say, hey, how did that go for, for you? And so that when you think about getting together the next time, you can be have a, re a full reflective comment on just the process that you're using. So mm -hmm. that was that was why. And, and yet, you know, it is uh, meant to, you know, be informal, but still pay attention to and respect uh, people's contributions to improving the process. Yeah, and it can only make the meetings better yeah. to have an, an opportunity to reflect on them. Mm -hmm. Good. Let's look at the second element that's uh, very important in integrating the new general manager. And this is what we're calling the quarterly check-in. The way we're conceiving of this, the general manager would be given certain questions at the time when he or she is hired, and then every quarter for that first year, be asked to submit written answers to these questions that the board can read. So this is how the board can know, the whole board, not just the board president or whoever is having the informal meetings, but the whole board can know how the job is working out for the new GM. Uh, after some reflection, we came up with these three questions. Uh, the original idea came from our colleague Marilyn Shaw, and we've uh, tweaked them some. But we thought a good question for the general manager to reflect on and then to answer in writing for the board is, what challenges and surprises have come up for you in your new position? Um, and how are you dealing with them? And how is it going with building all the new relationships that you need to build on behalf of the co-op? Th that last question, actually all three questions, are quite open-ended and not very specific. That's deliberate because what we're doing here is inviting the general manager to reflect and to feel free to share with the board anything he or she you know, feels is important here. Uh, again, we want to avoid the uh, approach of problem solving operational problems, but if those are among the challenges and surprises that the GM is dealing with, the board will know that. Um, so, Melanie, you had some experience with this? Um, actually, no, we didn't use this process, well, but um, the questions that are listed here were. Um, along the lines of the questions that we talked about during our informal check-ins. Oh, okay. I, I definitely like the idea of this, though, and wish that we would have known about this when I was transitioning. It certainly does give the general manager more to do, but we think that it would be very valuable for the board to be able to read and reflect on the general manager's answers. And in fact, that's why we think it should be in writing rather than the general manager making an oral report to the board meeting, just so that it can allow that reflectiveness uh, and uh, put a, let, not create tension around it, but just allow time to deliberate. Now, while the general manager has three questions, we're also suggesting three questions to the board. These questions would be discussed in the board meeting. They would be talked about. These would be, uh, shall we say, verbally discussed questions, not in writing. But there would be time on the board agenda every quarter also discussed to discuss how it's going. How does the general manager interact with the full board and individual directors? How are the, are the GM's reports meeting the board's needs? Are they clear and focused enough? And how well does the GM communicate? Uh, one of the challenges for general managers um, it might have come from other places where they were, in fact, uh, also a general manager and used to being in charge and knowledgeable and powerful come into an environment where they may not be able to answer questions. And so it's 
of particular value for the board to pay attention to how a GM responds to their questions, and including the questions they don't have the answers for. That can really tell you a lot about somebody. And it also how the board reflects on these and the feedback the GM gets from this will allow the GM to to rise to the board's expectations and do a better job. Um, again, I'm interested in whether the, uh, Melanie or Terry, have you had experience with this? Did you have quarterly check-ins of any kind and when you were new? Uh, this is Terry. I did not. Uh, I do think that's a good idea, though. Again, I think it would build that relationship and the expectations you have from each other, though. We did not do that, no. We did not do it either, but I would share that I feel like this would have been really useful um, to know whether or not my communication was what the board was expecting. Um, I think that sometimes it can be really challenging for a new general manager to get used to working for essentially nine people that are trying to speak with one voice. And sometimes there can be expectations above and beyond what's included in the executive limitations just in terms of communication and things like that. And it's really hard to understand where individual board members are coming from and to really hear the one voice from the board when it's coming from so many different places. So I think really um, taking some time to um, actually focus on this during that transition period would be very, very helpful for a new GM. Let's look at what a sample agenda might look like for the board meeting um, that this, for the quarterly board, the board meeting that falls at the time of the quarterly check-in. So it might look like this, that um, the topic is we're going to have a quick overview of the check-in process. So the facilitator, whoever is chairing the meeting, needs to remind the participants of how this is going to work so that people understand the purpose here. And that we're, what we're trying to do is create a successful relationship. We are not, this is not a time to critique uh, the general manager and uh, uh, so it's not time to interrogate the general manager. We don't want to turn this into um, an adversarial proceeding at all. So it just helps to frame the discussion that's about to happen. Five minutes on that. Then let's put 20 minutes into uh, the Q&A based discussion on the GM's written responses to the three check-in questions. Those will be in the board packet. And it also will be an opportunity for the board then to give the GM you know, to talk about how they see things going. So that's when they can have their discussion on the three check-in questions. And at the end, Note five minutes at the end to say, okay, this is what we accomplished. How did it go? Are there ways we could organize this better for the future? So that's a wonderful um, kind of model, if you will, for the next topic that we need to talk about, which is sort of a a practical way of dealing with something that Melanie raised, which is it can be difficult to work for a board. It's a different experience than working in a traditional hierarchical organization where you may have uh, one boss who's actually one individual. And that's just a different experience. In a sense, uh, the new general manager has to learn how to get comfortable watching that uh, many-headed uh, boss, if you will, think because that's what the board, in effect, does when it meets. So this sample agenda, for example, is a nice, it's a nice um, discipline for the board to go through. Um, and it's a good experience for the general manager to have an opportunity to watch the board basically thinking in action. 
So the next couple topics we need to talk about um, are related uh, to this question of what is it like? How does the general manager get acclimated to working in this in the new co-op environment? And <clears throat> there are two levels of orientation that need to go on. First of all, the general manager needs to understand something about the co-op and about how the board um, does its business, what its governance system is, how it makes decisions, um, and know something generally about the relationship of the board to the owners um, and, and that the structure of the cooperative. So it's a good idea for the board to be very intentional and think, preferably before the new GM arrives, what do you want your new general manager to know about your board? Some of this you may have thought through as a board in the search process, but in orienting the new general manager, um, this is the time to show clearly um, what the governance structure is, what is expected of the directors, what the directors expect of the general manager, what are the current projects the board's working on, and overall, what is the co-op trying to accomplish? What's it working towards right now? It's also a good idea for the co-op board to think as a whole, what does it want this new general manager to know about cooperative governance in general? And it may be a good idea, for example, for the general manager to consider attending one of the CDL 101 workshops and looking at the materials in the reader as an orientation to the larger world of cooperative governance. Did either of you, Melanie or Terry, did either of you have an orientation process? I know it was different because, Melanie, you were uh, sort of more transitioning from a different role in the organization. But Carrie, you came in from traditional, from a more traditional conventional grocery, right? Right, I did. I had no co-op experience whatsoever. And so how uh, did the board one, go? I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, how did the board go about orienting you to, this, to the different environment, to the co-op environment? Well, I did uh, less than, a, about a month after I came here, I did do the Seabelt 101 workshop. Uh, at a board uh, training in uh, Portland, Oregon. And one big advantage that I had was a previous GM, which most people know, CEP was a G GM at La Montanita for six years prior to my coming here. And he was in transition of going to work for the NCGA, so he was actually still here in the New Mexico for probably five months. So he and I would meet occasionally as well. I started off two times a week and one time a week, and whatever, as needed. Basis, and I had his expertise and his experience to fall back on at that point. It was kind of mentored to me along to uh, get me into the process and show me what I needed to know. And that was a big, big huge help for me, a big advantage in my opinion. That's great, yes. That's great help. Melanie, what happened for you? Because you were already at the co-op, right? Yeah, for me it was more of a transition into the new role and um, I did attend the CBL 101 workshop. I, in thinking back, I think it was about three weeks after I took the job. And so that was really, really helpful. It gave me an opportunity not only to learn a little bit more about the program and see the bigger picture, but I, I attended with a couple of my board members. And so it gave us an opportunity to work together a little bit that day. And that was a really, really good experience for me. That's great. Great. So if we could move to the next slide, Joel, what I'd like to do is talk about monitoring, which I think is um, the cornerstone of making a solid relationship with the new GM is for the board to hold strongly to the policies and the procedures that it has in place um, and for itself and for the new general manager. So. Um, what we would recommend is that the board hold the general manager accountable from the moment of hire from for the executive limitations and the end policies. The expectations of the job are the expectations of the job, and that monitoring should begin as soon as possible. Um, with maybe very limited exceptions, the board should not be lowering the, the bar for the quality of monitoring reports, but instead should be looking for excellence from the very beginning. Um, make sure that your general manager knows that there are resources available. Mark will talk in a minute about CBILD report support, um, which can be helpful to the managers in getting off on the right foot. And I'll talk in a minute about um, the communication support to the board policy, which is 
one of the places in the executive limitations of most co-op policy registers where a lot of the relationship between the board and the general manager is spelled out. And so that's one of that's an excellent place for for both parties to practice, if you will, um, the structure of their relationship and sort of um, tune their communication structure. So we would recommend that that policy be monitored an extra time. If it's only monitored once during the, the year ordinarily, uh, consider monitoring it a second time. And then remember that the monitoring is going to be the process of the GM evaluation, that the expectations that are set in the policy register are the expectations that the GM is going to be held to. Melanie, actually, could I start, Terry? I think you have kind of a unique experience, maybe, in in your start with La Montanita. When did you start working for them? It was in February. February eighth, two thousand eight. And when was your first board report due? Oh, uh, one week later. What? Well, <laughs> a week later after I started. So how did that go? Ah, yeah. uh, well, again, monitoring was one thing that I was very much concerned about when I came to the co-op. I've never done any type of monitoring reports. It was uh, very intimidating at first. And a week after I came, I, the first report was due to be posted. And CE did help me do the first report. He and I came in and did it together. And he showed me what his format was and how he was doing them. And they expected a high, high level of reporting. CE had, had got them accustomed to reporting anywhere from 20 to 25 pages per board report the long reports, often referred to as the most writing a master's thesis every month. But uh, he helped me, he did help me with the first one. And it came into month two, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this one myself without any help uh, from CE. So I wrote the, I wrote the second one myself uh, based on what I did off the first one. And I just wanted to get the learning curve over. I wanted to find out what they really expected from these reports. On my reports, not CE's reports, I wanted these to be my reports. And I wanted to uh, see what they thought, and uh, I made a few mistakes along the way, but it was a lot, it was a work in progress, and it's progressed along as I've moved along. I guess the one way to look at it, the first few months I was here, I'd probably spend 15 to 17 hours creating reports just for the board, a lot of time, and now I maybe average two hours uh, doing those reports at this point. But like I said, I just wanted them to, well, I want these to be Terry reports, not CE reports. I wanted to get used to my style of how to do these reports, and I was willing to take the uh, whatever mistakes that I made and just uh, just learn from that. And I, and I did make mistakes. But that's a great reminder, Terry. That you know, when when I teach about monitoring to boards, I'm always reminding them about you know they need to be ready to accept any reasonable interpretation of the policy right. and. When you have somebody new making reasonable interpretations, it can be surprising to the board, and it has to adjust to that new way of thinking. So that's a great way of putting it to, you know, accustom them to your style instead of to your style. And I'll admit, you know, I was highly, I was highly stressful about the board board meetings at that point. And our board's a great board, and uh, they were very, uh, very cooperative with me during that time period, so to speak, on, the, on my reporting. But I was very stressed out about when board reporting time came, particularly the first five or six months. And this is why that informal support, I think, is really important because stress isn't necessarily a bad thing if it, you know, encourages right. higher level of performance. But you need additional support if you're going to be able to sustain that and and perform well. That's great, Melanie. You had mentioned when we were talking something that I thought of um, as I mentioned maybe one one limited place where the board might consider lowering the bar for the quality of the monitoring reports or the, the quantum when you were talking about your first end report. Could you talk a little about that? Yes. I made a request of my board to allow me to present my first end report as an interpretation report only and um, requested that they not require me to provide data on that first run through and um, they agreed to do that for me and I think that I was thinking along the same lines as Terry when he said he really wanted those reports to be his own and I felt the same way um, particularly about the ENDS report and I really felt that I needed to get a year 
of time to come up with good data and um, good tracking systems and things like that so that I could really provide good data um, down the road. So I was very appreciative of the board's willingness to allow me to do that. That's great. And the really great news is that there are resources for general managers to use, um, not only new general managers, but uh, managers who have been, been in the job for a while, in terms of CBUILD's report support. Mark, did you want to talk about that just briefly? Well, sure. Um, and I think the, the idea that we would like to convey to boards we're going to have new managers and new managers is that the managers aren't in this alone when it comes to thinking about how to effectively report upstream to uh, to the board. Um, starting in in 2005, we really been involved uh, in in a collaborative effort with uh, a bunch of managers, including Terry and and Melanie, uh, to really get. Um, uh, people thinking about what effective reporting looks like and how you go about organizing for it. And the process, for example, that Melanie suggests is just, just fantastic that, hey, before I can give you a report, I really need to you know, think this through, maybe include others, maybe organize my data streams, all that kind of stuff. And, and the board should be very aware of, you know, that, that those types of ideas are going to be really worth a lot in the long run. And, um, and so our team with uh, Michael Healy really taking the lead most recently is, is focused on um, you know, uh, uh, bringing together some GM samples and providing a, a kind of a template for reporting. We have that in our library for each of the executive limitation policies that we have in our, in our sample set. Um, I think they're very usable and and also adaptable um, based on what a manager manager really wants to be reporting. And the whole idea of ENDS reporting is really emerging as, a, um, a, as something that people are sharing, managers are sharing their best thinking, and, and there's uh, some really nice work happening in, in ENDS reporting. And, and so the, the, the main takeaway we want to convey is that managers shouldn't feel like they're in isolation on, on how to think about reporting effectively because we have resources and their management peers who've really thought a lot about this and, um, and there's the resources available. Um, this is Carol. I'd just like to ask uh, also, Mark and Thane, you could say a little about this. We've been talking definitely in terms of policy governance here, boards using policy governance when we talk about monitoring reports. But um, the CBIL program does support some boards that aren't following policy governance per se. But we still, um, so I just wanted to make clear that there is support available uh, across the board, shall we say, for all kinds of boards uh, in co-ops that are part of the CBIL program. Yeah, yeah, and the, so mainly you just don't want to, you know, the, the idea of a manager feeling in isolation and, and really doing this completely on his or her own, um, you know, that'd be the tough road. And, um, and really the, the idea of the informal meetings uh, you know, again, we really were thinking to just make sure the boards were encouraging new managers to be connecting with others and taking advantage of resources that are available to help them do their jobs well. And the Seabuild Library, you know, has a bunch of stuff in there that would be helpful. As well as Seabuild consultants. I mean, Melanie, I think you've probably got some direct support, and Terry, you and I have worked together, and, and you know, so it's not even just the idea of, you know, reading about it, we, you know, there's direct help that a manager can get on doing this really well. I was lucky enough to sit next to Mark on an airplane it's a couple of weeks after I became the general manager and it was the best flight of my life because he told me all about this report support that was available and frankly I was feeling really overwhelmed about my reporting and I came home and, you know, went onto the website and just found all this amazing stuff and he, Mark emailed me some templates and I was just ready to rock and I was super excited when I found all this great stuff. So, it was wonderful. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry, Melvin. 
Well, I'll second that. Uh, actually, uh, a member of our board, the board president, we had some time uh, time with Seabill and asked me if I would like to talk to Mark uh, on uh, how to do reporting or help me with reporting. And uh, you know, it's, it was a fabulous idea because I got so much out of those uh, out of those sessions. One being, as Melody said, that I wasn't alone. That helped as much as anything else. And two, the sample reports at that time were on the NCJ website, and I still have them on my uh, desktop today. Even the older ones, I've still got those versions. And I don't know how many times I've referenced those. It's, it's, an, I couldn't even count. And I found those uh, so useful. If I get stuck, I'm trying to do a report, and my mind's just gone blank. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll refer to my samples, and I'll, all of a sudden I'll have an idea, and that gets me through. It's a great resource. And any, I would encourage any manager at New World to, to utilize the resource as well. Well, thanks so much for both your comments. That's, uh, I, we, we had that instinct that it was going to be worth uh, bringing the information in from the managers and putting it out in that form. And so great to know that it was useful. And, and now the stuff is available in the Seabuild library, and, and we hope people really take advantage of it. Also, uh, each Seabuild consultant is really equipped to provide excellent uh, one-on-one -on -one comments and coaching on the relationship and reporting. And that leads us actually neatly to our next slide because there are resources available for the board as well. Um, and what we have on the next slide is a sample uh, policy on communication and support to the board. Carolee, your point's really well taken. Whatever the governance method that a board is using, it's really important to have structure and to be clear about the relationship and about the expectations. And so this policy, um, no matter what governance system a board might be using, is very helpful because it, it clearly um, directs the general manager um, to support the board in the work that the board's doing. So it clearly establishes the relationship between the board and the general manager. In recommending that boards monitor this particular policy more often than usual, um, I think what we're hoping is that um, there will be an opportunity to focus in a formal way on the relationship and on the specific details um, that go into making a solid solid relationship between the board and the new GM. Um, the board's going to need timely monitoring reports. It's going to need to know about any actual or anticipated noncompliance. It needs to know what's going on in the, um, in the world that might affect the co-op, not only because the board needs this information, but in this early stage of establishing the relationship with the general manager, there's an opportunity to, um, in part, get a sense of what the general manager knows about in the world, but also to share information. This kind of information is important to us. That kind of information isn't. So there's a, a getting to know each other process that can go on to monitoring this. Um, there's an accountability piece, you know, that little sub-policy there requiring the general manager to um, provide an opinion if they're aware of some noncompliance on the board's part. Um, and just some nice role clarity pieces in the rest of the policy that can be very helpful in defining the relationship. Melanie, did you have thoughts about using the communication and support to the board policy? It seems to me you guys monitor a bit, not any more frequently than usual during your first year. Is that right? That's right. And in fact, it came several months in. And when you and I spoke before the webinar, um, I realized how nice it would have been actually to monitor that one early on and to to be more intentional about that pro that learning process about each other and, and and understanding the communications that are necessary for us to have a strong relationship so I'd highly recommend um, early monitoring of this one and definitely a couple of times during that first year from my perspective that's great if we could go to the next slide, you used the word, Melanie, uh, integrating, and and it is actually very important and uh, critical, in fact, that the board be intentional about how it goes about integrating the new general manager into its governing system, whatever that system is. 
um, for boards that are using um, a formal system like policy governance, there should already be a monitoring system or a schedule in place. And there's no need to change that system or schedule just because a new general manager uh, came online. Boards should expect reporting to begin um, just, you know, maybe not <laughs> within two weeks, but maybe. Um, as in Perry's case, he's demonstrated that it's possible. And certainly within one to two months of hire, monitoring should be proceeding on schedule. If we could go to the next slide. Could I add something to that? Yes, please. Could I just add that one of the things my board was willing to do was allow me to adjust the monitoring schedule once I had sort of gone through the cycle one time because some, some parts of the cycle didn't match up very well with how things kind of went during our fiscal year. And so they were they were pretty good about allowing me to make some changes to that so that it, when I was reporting, made more sense and that I was able to provide them better data because of that. So I would just um, encourage you to, to be a little bit flexible with that schedule. And, and Terry, you had mentioned something um, that's related in my mind. Um, you had mentioned that sometimes shortly after your hire, um, the board went through a policy review? We did. Well, I found uh, after I got here and started reading reports and policies, a lot of the data that I was, uh, I was reporting on was repetitive. I was using the same data for several different policies, and I felt this was not a good use of my time or the board's time either. So uh, we uh, I communicated to the board that, and we actually did a policy review and took out several policies I was previously been reporting on for years here at Lamont Ada prior to my coming, and just did away with those policies because they're just the same information worded in a different format. And I found that very useful to go through all these policies as well. We have to get an understanding, okay, we need this, we don't need this. And it was just it was, it was just time. When I got here, it was time to just review. And that's what we did for probably the first six months I was here. And see, that's an example of where real-life experience is really helpful to have um, in a workshop like this because um, from our perspective, we're assuming that everything is going, you know, smoothly and that the policy register is perfect and the monitoring schedule makes perfect sense and all that's changed is the general manager. But the real world is messier than that, and so we're not advocating that you throw out common sense. Um, but, but creating a process here, um, what Mark is going to, I think, just briefly explain is shown in this slide is a one way, if all that's changing in your world is the new general manager and everything else is going smoothly, um, there's a way to, no matter when in the monitoring cycle the new general manager arrives, it is possible to just pick right up and continue on. Mark, this is a really cool slide. Do you want to talk about this a little? It's just packed with information. Yeah, sure. And and yet I'm going to give the really simplistic uh, description in a minute. I want to build on uh, Terry and Melanie's comments there just a little bit. Number one, policies are expensive, so the board and manager should really work hard on making sure that, uh, I mean, ultimately it's a board responsibility, but as Terry pointed out, he brought up the issue and the board and, and management went through the policy review together. Have the policies that you need and want and not just some policies that you have accumulated over time. And again, we can really help with that and our sample policies are great examples of what we think are you know, pretty useful policies to take a look at. And then Melanie's example of adjusting the schedule is really terrific because your schedule should be optimized to tie into real life. And it's not really uh, an, an, an arbitrary schedule. There are some reports that make a lot of sense to fall in, certain, in a certain pattern. And so as Thane was suggesting that we've assumed that there is a pattern and that the pattern makes sense, but certainly be open to uh, adjusting that to make sure that you're making, taking full advantage of, you know, the co-ops resources in terms of when reports are delivered. Um, so the top part of this uh, picture, the uh, what we're demonstrating in the green row across the top, and then the red and purple uh, larger cells there in the second row is kind of what we would say is the normalized uh, monitoring process and underneath the green, the, the, the normalized GM evaluation process. 
So as we've already covered, our concept here is, you know, get into the monitoring process as soon as possible. We're suggesting one to two months, not kind of take a really relaxed view, but really to see that having the policies and the monitoring is how the accountability part of the relationship uh, takes place. The other things that we were talking about are more of the how are we successful together and how do we work together and all that, but the policy and the reporting that actually allows the manager to be accountable to the board and the board to be accountable to the to the members. So we're suggesting like don't put that part off, kind of jump in. And the the yellow part, so the one, two, three, four rows of pale yellow and, and bright yellow are really examples. We want to kind of test it out that if you, like in the first row, if you hired a new GM in, in January, maybe you could start monitoring right away in February. Or the next one, if you hired a new GM in March, maybe you could start monitoring in May, right? That, that it, 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 it did seem uh, very possible to us that you could, you could have that level of, of rigor uh, around the monitoring, especially if there's good support for the manager in, in figuring out you know, how to do it. Um, so the, the stars on the, in the yellow area are the quarterly check-ins. So we're saying look for that pattern of how do we do those quarterly things. We've kind of bolded. We added in the board um, communication and support. See those in BD, COM, just to show that, look, we're being thoughtful about scheduling some additional um, you know, uh, monitoring of that policy. But um, you know, really the idea was instead of adjusting the whole routine because you have a new person, keep the routine the same because there is a logical place for your ENDS report to be delivered. There is a logical uh, four times a year for financial conditions. Some of these things have a real natural home and really try and honor that and then integrate your new, your new manager into that system. Uh, at the same time, have common sense like Melanie is saying, hey, it really was great that I was able to deliver my ENDS interpretations and not try and do a full you know, accomplishment report. That was, that was a great, great idea, Melanie, and, and it would be, I, I don't think it's lowering the bar. I would say it's really showing that we do have high expectations and yet we used common sense in terms of what, what made sense this time around, right? Um, so let's see, if you don't have a schedule in place for monitoring, if you don't have a system like this, um, we would really encourage you to set one up because this is how um, you know most of the co-ops that we work with really uh, fulfill accountability within the within the co-op. And so to not have a, a way of reporting in place a structure for this, um, I think would make it you know more difficult for the board and manager to really get off the ground in terms of what this uh, part of the relationship would be like. So Terry, what's your take on uh, on this idea of integrating the reporting, in, integrating the manager into the existing reporting cycle, and getting a fast start with that? I agree 100 percent with that. I think in my case, I think it worked very well. And two, uh, plus if you have a uh, if you have this cycle in place, it gives the GM. I know what reporting is coming up two months from now. If there's something I need to gather, or I need that data. Then uh, it gives me time to prepare. And I would hate to think about, we've always had that in place here at Lamont and Nita, and I would hate to think that if it wasn't in place, I don't know if I could, it would be a hard adjustment for me to make if we didn't have that structure. Mm -hmm. I just think Thanks. it makes sense. Yep. Yeah. I definitely agree with Terry. I don't know what I would do without the structure of the schedule. And, you know, I jumped right in. There wasn't any, nobody ever even thought about not starting monitoring immediately. <laughs> it was just something that we did. and. You know, one of the things that I really appreciated about my board was that they realized that it was a learning process for me and so that my reports weren't necessarily perfect the first time around, but they saw improvement as I learned and each month in those first few months the reports got better and better and, and as I learned how to use the tools and all of that everything got better. So they they allowed for that learning curve and they allowed for me to be human and I definitely appreciated that very much. Mm -hmm. 
Nice. Here's a couple of other interesting kind of ways to see the picture. Um, if you if you look at the the red and the purple there, that those August, September, and October months, that where we lay out the steps for the GM evaluation, and that's really fully explored in the GM evaluation workshop uh, and slides. But our thought would be that you know even if the GM was hired in June, have the board still go through this process in August, September, and October, so that the board could could look at the whole year in terms of evaluating. Uh, 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 downstream in, ma in management's, uh, you know, how, how it's gone as opposed to tying the evaluation cycle, let's say, into the anniversary date of the general manager. The benefits of this are really huge because in the end it's going to tie into your fiscal year ending and, and uh, annual reporting and all this other stuff. Also, so it might you, tie into your board election cycle, too. Uh, yeah, thanks. You, Mm -hmm. Very much board election cycle, really some of the strategic issues around monitoring. And then the last point I was going to make was that uh, the setting of process for GM compensation, which we have a whole workshop on, uh, our, our thought, again, is that first compensation package that a new general manager receives would be a bridge package that would move you into uh, a, a cycle that actually makes sense given the overall timing of everything, and so not to use the anniversary period in the long run uh, for compensation or evaluation. We don't really have that explored here, but if you go to the GM compensation workshop, I think you'll be able to make the connection between this concept and then getting into that regular pattern. In, in fact, what I'd like to say here is the only thing that really does acknowledge the fact of the uh, gen the time of the general manager's hiring is when the quarterly check-ins are held. Otherwise, in every other way, basically we're saying that the co-op already has its cycle. The new general manager will step into that, but only the quarterly check-ins vary with the time of hire of the individual general manager. We did this exact same thing when I was hired here at La Montanita. I came on board in February '08. Our fiscal year ends August, and we did a uh, evaluation in August. And then we did another evaluation in February, six months later, just kind of a check-in. Then we got on the regular cycle after that. I found that worked very well. Okay, thank. You. Or Carly, back to you. Yes, yeah. I think it's time for us to look at our next our next slide. Um, I am a person who works frequently with boards of directors in the process of hiring new general managers. And I'm fully aware of the huge time investment that boards make in that process. It's arguably one of the most important decisions a board ever has to make. Now, at that point, what I've noticed is a tendency for board members to feel like we just ran a race. Now can we sit down and congratulate ourselves? We hired the new GM, let them take over. But actually, when the new GM is hired, now is the time to invest more time and effort in that relationship. And by starting off right with a good relationship between the board and the general manager, the board builds on the investment that it put into the hiring process. And that's why we've presented this uh, seminar today. Um, yeah, thanks, Carly. One point I wanted to make in the introduction that I feel really is very relevant to this this idea is that um, you know you might not if you if you're an, uh, already an up and running uh, co-op and 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 you have a great general manager in place, this idea might seem foreign. And yet, eventually, we're going to have a new general manager. <laughs> it's like we know we're it's like we're not always going to have everyone that we know and love in those roles and. Um, and there has been a lot of transition and, and a lot of startup co-ops, so there are a lot of new general manager relationships forming. So these are really important ideas to keep in mind now, I think. Mark, I would like to add, you know, when I came to La Montanita, I didn't look at this GM board relationship as a boss-employee relationship. And I don't today. I think we're, uh, we have to look at it as we're a team and we have common goals. And here we try to remember that it's not about me, it's not about the board, it's about the co-op. What's best for the co-op, not me individually or them individually. What's best for our members. 
And as long as I can keep that idea alive, I think we're I think any GM would be be very well ahead of the game. But it doesn't it's not ad, it's not an adverse relationship. It's a it's a team it's a team working together. Not very much look at that, not only with their board but with staff as well. Well, I think we have, uh, let, let's look again at the slide of the um, calendar pen. Um, I think that the, um, we were going to show this one more time uh, to make the point here about, uh, just to give the uh, viewers a chance to look at it one more time here because it is complex, but I think it does summarize everything visually. We want to make the point that new GMs come in, whenever they happen to be hired, they step into a cycle that already exists, and they start moving with that cycle. Uh, Thane, I think you were going to speak about the resources available. Absolutely. I wanted to listen. Melanie or Terry, do you have, you know, words of wisdom or inspiration that you want to share for new GMs or for their boards to help them get off to the right foot? Anything that we didn't mention tonight? Uh, I have a couple. You know, Go ahead, Terry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Melody. I would just say, you know, don't be afraid to uh, go to the board if you have a concern. I think uh, getting off the relationship on a strong basis from the beginning is the key. If you can do that, I think uh, the uh, the chances for success are greatly increased for both parties. No, I would say, I would say um, to both the GMs and the boards just to keep in mind that the GM is is in this transition period and they're balancing a lot of responsibilities and learning a lot of new things, and so just to kind of realize that <laughs> and recognize that that's um, very much a reality for them as they're transitioning in. And I would also add um, from the board side that not to forget the importance of really following your own rules and following your own policies and remaining in that governance position so that it's really clear what the board's role is versus what the general manager's role is in those first few months. I think that that's really key. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you both, and Mark and Carolee. It's a wonderful thing to have the chance to work with you all, um, and I'm very grateful for your participation tonight. Remember that these online recorded workshops, there are additional related workshops available in the Seabuild Library on acting on the GM monitoring reports. There's one on GM evaluation and an another on setting a process for GM compensation. All of these are excellent tools for boards to use to go forward and build a solid and lasting relationship with an excellent general manager. And we encourage you to use them and to use them with the assistance of your CEDO consultant so that you can get the most value out of them. And with that, I think we have covered the material we came to talk about tonight, and I'll say thank you very much. <laughs>